This is the painting I'd like to talk about today. It's an oil painting, a large oil painting, 64 by 46 inches, done in 2002. And the reason I'd like to talk about it is because it was painted in layers. It was painted step by step. And we're going to look at those steps, one after the other. First, fast, in this animated version, And then we're going to look at the painting and look at those steps one at a time to describe what's going on because each step that follows is built on what goes before and is influenced by what goes before. And so we want to see how all those layers work together to create this final image. Welcome to my studio. My name is Leonard Kozianski. I'm the artist of this picture. And I'd like to talk to you today about the oil painting process as it applies to this painting called Bird Dog. Well, it began in 1985 with a bronze sculpture that I made, which was very popular. Uh, it's about 25 inches high by 19 inches wide uh, in an edition of seven, which sold out almost immediately. But I kept one for myself and it became the basis for several paintings, which I did over the years. So let's look at the process by which these paintings were created. Now, when I begin a painting, I begin with a charcoal line drawing on the canvas. Then I go over those lines with brush and ink. And the ink is water-based, so that anything that's turpentine-based that goes over the top of it won't dissolve those lines, won't smear those lines. So, after the ink lines are dry, then I rub with a rag a reddish-brown tone over the whole canvas. And you can see that reddish-brown tone throughout this image, and you can see it in the lower right corner of this image. You can see, even see the rag marks. It's basically a reddish-brown paint mixed with turpentine, which is wiped over the drawing with a rag and allowed to dry. Once that's dry, then a value underpainting is put over the top of that using black and white. So that I then have an image that's in black, white, and middle value, which creates a, a, a light and dark rendition of the subject with no color. But because I have used black and white, this forms a foundation for the oil colors that will go over the top of it. Because oil paint is transparent, oil paint is translucent. And though it can be opaque, it's often translucent. And if we paint something underneath, it will influence what goes over the top of it. So the next step in painting this picture was to develop the painting uh, with a fair amount of detail, starting with the background and moving to the foreground, because the foreground it sort of covers the background. So the first step was to begin blocking in and rendering some of the clouds, and then I became more complete with the clouds, and then third, I got even more complete in the distance with the clouds, and so once the sky was complete, then I could begin to address the rest of the picture. Now first, I needed to paint in some of the foliage, the trees. And I needed the trees in the distance to have less contrast than the trees up close. So notice that the background trees are painted with less contrast, the middle ground trees more contrast, and then those trees that go in between will have sort of a, a, a contrast quality between the two. And so the middle ground trees go in and the houses start to go in because this scene takes place in suburbia. This is a suburban landscape. And in this suburban landscape, we see the law of the jungle. We see conflict. We see animal energy and anger. Do those exist in suburbia? The next step is to start to put in some of the dark colors in the grass. 
and some of the middle ground grass. Now by putting in those dark colors in the grass, those colors will be covered over to a great extent, but a lot of that darkness will flicker through to create, sort of a, a, give the, the grass a more realistic appearance. The next step, a green is put over the grass, green brush strokes, using, using a round brush like this. Okay, I take this brush and I mix paint that's fairly fluid. I mix paint with a lot of oil-based medium, in linseed oil-based medium, and then dip the brush into the palette, and then I can create sort of slashing strokes to create the effect of individual blades of grass. Though, when I'm painting it, I'm really thinking about the form of the hill as a whole. Then more blades of grass are put in, lighter shades, starting to create a sense of light, a sense of highlight, and then even more lights, giving the grass an even more round and illuminated appearance. Now, the shadowy parts of the grass are just as important. And so we have to paint that cast shadow from the dog onto the grass and make those dark blades specific and have give them more varied color. And then we develop the grass and the hill even a little bit more to make it a little more round, a little more illuminated. Now the next step, sort of a drastic step, is to apply color to that bird form, that bird image. It's not any specific raptor. It's not an eagle or a hawk per se. It's no specific species. It's a symbolic bird because this is a symbolic conflict taking place in suburbia. And we use red because red is a color that is associated with anger, blood, um, uh, conflict, uh, heat, and, you know, those are the emotional qualities that we're trying to represent here. Because this is a surrealist painting, this is a visionary work, it's sort of a dreamscape more than a realistic landscape. We want it to look real, we want it to be convincing, to be almost palpable in its realism, but we don't want it to represent any specific species of bird or dog. People ask me, are those dogs or wolves? And I have to say, well, you know, I really can't say that it's a symbol, a symbol that represents one side of a conflict. And so as we continue with the bird, we develop the highlights on the feathers and they start to look more illuminated and more round. The feathers on the neck and the wings, uh, they start to glisten. And then we have to paint in the underside of those wings to illuminate them to give those feathers a very solid sense of, of, of presence. And also because they're illuminated by the light reflecting off the dog's back. And so we get up close, we can see that we're really starting to develop those feathers more completely and getting a sense of illumination on the light side and on the shadow side. There's reflection on the light side feathers, and then there's a reflection of light off of the shadow side on the, the belly of the bird and the underside of the bird's wings. But we want also for there to be a sense of transparency to those bird wings. And so we start to put that sort of glowy red in between the feathers to create a sense of transparency on the shadow side of that bird's wing that's closest to us. Well, the next thing we want to do is start painting the, the canine, the wolf, the dog. And we use a greenish tone because that's the opposite of red. It's also kind of a, a spooky color, uh, a lurid sort of mysterious color. And we want our uh, dog to look like it is sort of in this dreamlike conflict with the bird. And so we use a brush similar to what we used before. Okay, we use a, a round brush, but a smaller round brush. And we dip it into green paint that's been mixed with a lot of medium to make it fairly fluid. And then uh, we can do these sort of like strokey strokes to create a furry texture to that dog's body. 
And next, you know, we develop that shadow side of the dog even more. We're looking at the dog's anatomy uh, and, and, you know, rendering it with these furry strokes. We also want the light side of the dog to be painted and to be rendered and for there to be a smooth transition from the light to the dark. But notice at this stage that the dog's snout and tail are really not that developed yet. And so that's what we have to do next. We want to develop the tail, uh, the snout. We also want to start to give maybe a sense of realism to the teeth, make them look round, make them look illuminated. You know, we get up close, we can see that we're getting fairly uh, solid looking with those teeth. Uh, the, the bird is coming along nicely, as is the dog's fur, but the bird, uh, the, the beak and the claws are still sort of in that early phase. They're not really developed yet. And, and the dog's gums are still in that early phase of brown and white. And so in this next stage, we've developed the, uh, the gums of the dog, and uh, we're beginning to get more of a sense of detail in the picture as a whole. We still have to work on those claws and beak. And so that happens next. And we use sort of a gold, a generic gold color for the beak and the claws because those are similar to what we see in nature, but they're not natural in that they are not like any specific species of eagle or hawk or raptor. This represents a, a, a symbolic world. It represents sort of the law of the jungle in suburban landscapes. It represents conflict, anger. You know, anger is a very important emotion for us. It's a real motivator. It gets us to do a lot of things that we wouldn't normally do. It's a very important and very valuable emotion. And in this picture, we see sort of uh, uh, the conflict uh, in an unresolved state. We don't know who's going to win. Is the bird going to win? Is the dog going to win? You know, they're sort of opposite in color and opposite in energy. And here we get up close, we can see we're getting more detailed with the bird, with the bird's eyes and beak and claws. And notice that we're now painting that dog that's running away from the conflict. It doesn't want anything to do with that conflict. And so now our underpainting, and remember this is an underpainting, is more complete. It has detail. The colors or the rendering of the objects in their symbolic colors is fairly complete. But the colors are a little flat, a little shallow, and not very complex. And the space could be more fully realized. And though if we look up close, we can see that we've gotten fairly detailed with this image. And in fact, we've even gotten detail with the dog's eye, with the reflection and the details in the dog's iris. But the next step is to apply glazes. Okay, we had an underpainting, a fairly detailed and complete underpainting. Now we're going to apply oil glazes over the top of this picture. And so we use a blue glaze over the background and the middle ground and a red glaze over the foreground. Notice we can see the, the blue glaze on the roof of the house. And we can also see the red glaze on the grass behind the dog. This gives a greater sense of space, a greater sense of contrast, which is very important. It also gives a real interesting sense of light, a very strong warm light in the foreground and a, a cold light in the background. It also creates luminous colors. Now what is a glaze? Well this is what a glaze looks like on the palette. And what it is is it's just a transparent pigment that has been mixed with a lot of medium to sort of create a transparent paint. Oil paint comes in two different basic categories. There are opaque pigments and there are transparent pigments. And here transparent pigments have been mixed with a lot of medium and then they are brushed over this canvas. A blue glaze in the background, a reddish glaze, a reddish brown glaze in the foreground, 
and that creates a sense of space, complexity. Notice that those greens aren't so green anymore. They're more gray. They're a little more naturalistic, though the bird really becomes more dramatic in its color because a red glaze is put over the red paint, and that makes it even a more glowing, luminous red. So then the next thing we do is before that glaze has a chance to dry, or before those glazes have a chance to dry, we take a rag and we wipe away the glaze from some of the highlights, from some of the lighted areas. And this gives a greater sense of detail, also a greater sense of realism. Uh, the glaze is never completely wiped away, but we're using it to give us a greater sense of roundness to the forms. So the highlights on the clouds are wiped away, the highlights on the dog and the bird are wiped away, though the glaze is kept fairly intact in the shadowy and middle tone areas. It not only uh, creates complexity of color, it also provides some nice transitions from shadow into light. And then once that glaze is dry, then we can paint back over the top of that and add a little more depth to the darks a little more highlight to the lights, which give this painting uh, an even more complete finished appearance. And so here we have the finished picture. Bird Dog, an oil painting that's 64 by 46 inches wide. Now, let's run through those stages once again, quickly. And we can see, little by little, the different phases of the painting, each step built one on top of the other to create that finished painting. Now, once the painting is dry, it's important that it uh, be varnished and then framed because it needs to be sent out into the world. And uh, it needs to be sent out into the world so it can influence the lives of other people. It can interact with other people. Uh, because, you know, this is a symbolic painting, a, a, a painting about uh, anger and conflict and and sort of ennobling them, making those sort of negative emotions beautiful. And so uh, by living with this, maybe uh, helping us to appreciate the anger and conflict in our own life. And so we let the painting dry, we varnish it, we frame it, and then we send it out into the world. And the first step in that process is to send it to a serious art gallery. In this case, the O.K. Harris Gallery in Soho. And here we see the owner, Ivan Karp, sitting on the steps of his gallery. Ivan Karp is a legend in the art world. He discovered a lot of the pop artists. And when he got this painting, this painting of mine, he loved it and sold it to a very serious collector. So here is the painting once again. Bird Dog. A painting, a symbolic, surrealist, visionary painting about conflict, anger, intensity in the suburban landscape, in the suburban world. Thank you for watching this video. And please subscribe, because when you subscribe, you help me and help me to make more of these videos. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe, like, and share.